Uh, would, can we read Psalm 139 together, adults? And just, we're going to do what we did two weeks ago, and we're going to read it out. And what I want to know is, what, what strikes you, what do you like in, in that psalm? What, what's the verse you go, ah, that, I like that verse. I need to hold on to that verse. So Psalm 139, and we're going to read it out loud together. And remember, as you're listening, you're looking for what's the verse that strikes you that you go, ah, I really like that verse. Okay? Sharon. Sure. Nicholas, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. Mm. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will hide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark uh, to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. All right, verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Hmm. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that fully. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, Lord. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Nikki, verse 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred. Them, I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Hmm. So tell me, what, what, somebody tell me what verse stuck out to you? What phrase? What, maybe it's just a single word. You go, I really like that word. I don't want to know why. I just want to know what it is. So don't tell me why you liked it. Just tell me what you liked. Yeah? Somebody start us off. Max, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. The whole verse or a specific phrase? All of it. Someone else said something. 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Nicholas, did you have one as well? 23 as well. Verse 3. Mm. Someone else? Anyone else? A verse, a phrase, a word that particularly stuck out? 16 to you as well? I like verse 15, that word, that, that phrase, my frame. 
I like that, that phrase. I, I won't explain why, but you can ask me later. <laughs> or I'll, maybe I'll say it later. Anyone else? A phrase, a verse, a word, something that sticks out to you? Mm -hmm. We did this two weeks ago. We did it again today. One of the things that we value as a church is, is getting back to reading the Bible simply and just, this is God's message to us, His Word. And sometimes we jump in and we immediately start going, oh, this makes me think of this verse and this is what it means and this. And we just want to start very simply with going, what, what strikes us? What, it's the first step of going, what might the Lord be saying to me in this moment right now from His Word? Is what's the thing that sticks out to you? And so that's where we start. And w w I when, as we start small groups again in the, in the, in the fall, we're going we're gonna to do a little more of this in, in Bible study and, and very simply walking through what strikes you and, and what is he saying to you personally? Not to everybody else, not to the world, not to the church, just to you. Yeah? And so it, in a sense, as we're, as we're talking this morning, the verse that stuck out to you, I want you to go away going, okay, what is, why, why did the Lord make that verse stick out to me? What, what's he trying to say to me through that verse? Yeah? That, and I'm going to talk about just through the psalm briefly, but as you go away, that the thing that stuck out, what's the Lord? I could say lots of nice words up here, but actually, if, if the, the Bible is true, that means that God doesn't need me for you to hear from Him through the Bible. Now, we do teaching and preaching. We do stuff from, from in church. But actually, that personal, and that this psalm is the epitome of the personal relationship with God. And so we want you to hear from God for yourself. And the Bible says, it's possible by the power of the Holy Spirit that you can say, ah, oh, this verse strikes me. What's he trying to say to me? What does he want me to go away and do about it or think differently or be differently? Yeah? So that's why we have done that. We did it two weeks ago. We're doing it this week. We might do it again in the future as well. We'll do it in our small groups as we go into September. Um, let me just walk through what struck me from this psalm as I read through it. That first six verses, you, we have a God who knows you. You are known. Did you notice in verses 1 through 3, He searched you, He knows you, He knows when you sit up, sorry, when you get up, when you, when you sit down, when you rise up. He knows your habits, your rhythms. He knows when you come in and when you go out. He knows your thoughts from afar. He knows your path, where you're going. He knows where you sleep when you lie down. He knows your words, all of your ways, every word before it's on your tongue. <coughs> you know it all, Lord, all together. And verse 5 for me is key. He's not someone who just knows you inside and out like no one else can. But he hems you in. It's the, it's the idea of, of protecting something that's valuable. He hedges you and he hems you and he protects you. And his hand is upon me, says the psalmist. The hand of God being on you is the place of blessing. It's the place of closeness with him. It's the place of intimacy in that sense. So he's the God who knows you and who cares for you, takes care of you. So it's not a you know the song, it's the police song, every, every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. It's a bit of a creepy song. It sounds like a love song, but it's kind of creepy. It's not this kind of knowing. This is not a stalker knowing. This is, this is a God who, who protects, who treasures his creations. And David gets to that place. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's, it's almost overwhelming. And yet, friends, our soul longs to be known in that way. If, if you look, if, if I look at my own life, if I look at our, the culture around us, we're constantly longing for, searching for, to be known, whether it's in romantic love or friendship love or social media, we're projecting ourselves because we want people to know us. 
You long to be known. And God actually knows you in a way that your soul longs to be known. He knows you in a way that your soul longs to. He's the only one who can. And He's the only one that it's perfectly safe to let Him know you absolutely. Anyone else will take, eventually take advantage, will eventually hurt you. But God, He hems you in. His hand is upon you. Verses 7 through 12, he's not only, he not only knows you perfectly, but he's always with you. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I, I read this and I, I get through the first six verses, and then I get to the, the next six verses, and I think, I, I don't, I, sometimes I don't want him to be with me all the time, because okay? I've got sin in my life. You see, friends, when we're known at that level, when a God who is perfect, who knows us perfectly, and we have sin in our lives, the natural reaction of sin is that we want to hide. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. They sinned, and what did they do? They hid from God because they have guilt, because they have fear, because they have shame. And David is going to get to dealing with sin, but he has a God who is always with him him and that's a reassurance we'll deal with the sin thing more in a second so god who knows you a god who is always with you every moment of your day in the hard conversations in the hard moments in the painful moments in the joy in the the rejoicing the wonderful joe and nikki just had first grandbaby the joy and the rejoicing that's happening there as they're watching they've been planning they've been waiting and they're moving away as well and i'm not very happy about that but this has got grandchildren, family. It's ah, oh, God is with them in that as well. He knows you, He's with you. And sin makes us want to hide. But, friends, the truth is, we need to run to Him in our sin. If you've got something in your life that you're, you're hiding, you're avoiding dealing with the Lord, with sometimes it plays out practically, we, we avoid other Christians. We avoid church sometimes. sometimes. We avoid doing our, spending time in the Bible. We avoid certain conversations because actually we're avoiding God because we've got something that wants to deal with us. And we, we're going, no, I, I'm trying. Jonah teaches us that you can't actually run from God. But we can, we, we can turn our, we can turn a part of ourselves off. It's a dangerous thing to do because you start to get callous. David said, he's always with me. He knows me. He's with you. Even in your sin. Don't run away from him in your sin. Run to him. And then verse 13 through 16. He knows you. He's with you. He made you. He made you. Those wonderful verses. You knitted me together. See the imagery there? You ever watched someone who's a skilled knitter knit? I mean, they can just, they don't even have to look at it. Just buzzing along. I had a, a lady in a church in the States, and she would, she, she did the lyrics for, for the singing. But during the sermon, she would sit there and knit as she listened to the sermon. And she just, she was watching, and she would just knit. He knit you together in your mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame, that Psalm 103 uses that same language, my frame. He knows my frame. He knows that we are but dust. My frame. Vulnerable, wonderful, fearfully made. Your frame was not hidden before him, even when it was made in secret. So he, he knows you. He's with you. He made you. He made you exactly as He wanted you. You've probably got stuff in life where you go, I wish I could be different. I'm not good enough. I'm not... Uh, God made you exactly as He wanted, and yet, as, as He wanted you. And yeah, he's, he's working on you, but you don't owe Him anything in the sense of He takes you as you are. In one sense, you owe Him everything. A very important sense. But He takes you, you don't have to earn His love. He gives it to you. We have stuff in our lives where we think, oh, I'm not good enough, I need to change, uh, this person doesn't like me, that person, I have to please my uh, God says, no, I made you, I'm the one that matters. He knows you, He's with you, He made you. He numbered all of your days, written down, there's that idea of purpose, He has purpose for you as well. And David gets to verse 17. How precious 
to me are your thoughts, O God. You see, the natural response to a God who knows you, who loves you, who accepts you, who values you, who's with you, who made you, who has purpose for you, the natural response to that kind of God is to treasure Him. To treasure Him. To, to give Him everything. To do anything to be with Him. How precious to me are your thoughts. David knows the God who knows him and he treasures him. If I'm honest, I can think of moments where I have treasured the Lord Jesus and moments where I haven't. Yeah? But those moments of treasuring him, we, we were singing together and we, we ended, what was our third song? Endless Praise. We ended with Agnes Day. And we were singing just the voices and there was a moment of just treasuring the Lord, being together as His people. There's moments throughout the week. The psalmist treasures the Lord. In verse 19 through 22, when you treasure the Lord, what you treasure determines what you hate. The, the psalmist uses black and white language. It's a very Hebrew way of saying it. It's an ultimate way of looking at things. I love these things. I hate these things. And it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a wrong way of talking in the sense that one day everything will be revealed. All of our allegiances and our loyalties will be revealed. The psalmist talks about them now in an ultimate sense. He knows where he stands. I'm with Jesus. I treasure the Lord. And I, I, I'm not with those people, the people who are against God. I'm not with them. I'm with the Lord. And so what you treasure determines what you hate, where you don't stand with. And so friends, we stand in the world. We are we're distinct from the world because we're known. God is with us. You're made. He loves you. He gave His Son on the cross for you. And that makes you distinct because you look to Him and we treasure Him. Him, which means we are not on the same page as the world, as those who don't know Jesus. It doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're against them in the sense that we're trying to destroy them and persecute them. It doesn't mean that we, we can't live amongst them and, and, and love them as Jesus wants us to love them. But it does mean that we're not on the same page with them because we treasure the Lord Jesus. And actually what they need is to know Jesus as well. David ends in verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Three thoughts as we close. You're known, accepted, loved, welcomed. God has purpose for you. When you know God in Jesus, all of those things are true. And friends, we need to operate from that place. When we try and operate from our own place of self-acceptance and self-worth and the worth and the acceptance of other people can give to us, marriages, parenting, children, career, uh, relationships go down the drain. Because we're, we're, we're trying to earn our worth. We're trying to, and God says, no, no, I've given it all to you. Rhett's going to have been doing this, we've been reading a, a marriage book together as we do on occasion, and it was, it was saying, actually, as, as a spouse, when you come in and you need your spouse to, to give a certain amount of worth to you and a certain amount of, of respect, and you need to get that, otherwise you can't function, that's really not good for, that's, marriage can't operate that way. Actually, you need to come in, both spouses, and know that actually, I, Jesus suffices for me. He gives me, I need to learn how to receive those things from Him so that I can serve my spouse, and vice versa. Marriage is, is, is the most intimate of human relationships, so it's true in marriage, it's true everywhere else, but at a lesser degree, if you will. Yeah. So we need to come, we need to operate from that place of God loves me. He accepted me. He, ch he, he chose me. He gives me value. He gives me purpose. The second thing is linked to it. We live in a culture that is desperate for that and is trying to give self Worth, self-acceptance, self-love, self-care. And they sort of work to a point, but they, don't, they never hit your soul. They never hit your soul. Friends, you don't need 
to love yourself. You don't need to forgive yourself. You don't need other... What you need is to know that God loves you, that He forgives you, that He gave His Son, Jesus, on the cross. We're going to talk about it later as we take communion together in our bring and share. He gave His Son to suffer a brutal death on the cross for you. For you. And when you know that and it starts to sink deep into your heart and you keep coming back to it in the scriptures and your devotion time as you hear it as we gather together and you start to operate from that place of uh, I, you, have a, you, you come from a place of confidence. You don't have to walk with your head down. You don't have to, you can actually serve others rather than, and we need people as well. Don't, don't get me wrong. We need relationships. But when we become dependent on them, for things that only God can do for us. We get ourselves into trouble. Last thing is this. Verse 24. If there be any grievous way in me, see, see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The way everlasting. Friends, eternal life doesn't start when you die. It starts now. And God is a good father. He deals with your sin in your life that's going to stop you from enjoying eternal life now. And so let me repeat that again. If you've got sin in your life, run to Him in your sin. Don't run away from Him. Because the sin in your life, once you know Jesus, He's got you. Nobody can take you away from Him. But ongoing sin in your life, it stops you from enjoying eternal life now. So friends, we want to be a community where we deal with those things in an ongoing way. Because we want to enjoy eternity, life with Jesus now. He knows you. He's with you. He made you. Treasure Him. Run to Him in your sin. Know that He loves you more than you can imagine.